Hello, everybody. This is James McDaniels, and you are listening to the NBA and NASCAR Power Half Hour. I am your host, and we have got another great show on tap for you guys today, and quite a busy show of that. I mean, we've got a lot of stuff that happened at Talladega this week with NASCAR, a lot of big wrecks, uh, kind of some motions kind of flaring up, a surprise winner. So we'll talk all about the Sprint Cup race at Talladega, which is always great. And then we'll talk some NBA. We have the MVP award that was awarded. I think you probably all know who won it. But we'll talk a little bit about that. We have another NBA player who's won MVPs in the past. But uh, he's not winning an MVP right now with his parents. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the latest news in the uh, NBA playoffs, where they stand. Um, and then look ahead of the future to uh, the upcoming uh, NBA Finals. So... We've got a lot of stuff to talk about today, and I'm going to also have some video for you guys to listen to, too. So uh, let's get right to it. So first thing I want to go over with is obviously the NASCAR Sprint Cup race at Talladega. Very, very big ra racetrack. It is the largest NASCAR racetrack on the Sprint Cup circuit um, at 2.66 miles. So Dega, Dega it's really fast. It's just like Daytona, a super speedway where drafting is king. Yeah, you know, like really, really big drafting. It's one of the two uh, restrictor plate tracks in case uh, you need some information there. But um, that's basically a rundown on Talladega. So think of Talladega as just a slightly different Daytona. But um, so uh, Talladega is known for a lot of passes, a lot of different leaders, because pretty much anybody, as long as they have, you know, a standard car, they're going to be able to you know, get up to the front because they can draft, anybody can draft, and all the cars work the same way under drafting. It's not like all the other tracks where it's based on, like, how good your car handles and how uh, fast your car is coming off corners and, and just all that other stuff. Talladega, really, you don't you don't use any brake. The looseness and tightness of your car really doesn't, does not matter because you just run the uh, throttle wide open just the whole time. So really, Talladega, really, really different place. So everybody can get an equal chance, really, to win. And that's kind of the situation that happened at this race. All right, so we have this guy. All right, his name is uh, David Reagan. And this guy, um, he's only won one NASCAR race in the past. That was at Daytona, I believe, back in 2011. But uh, so anyway, David Reagan, um, he, he didn't, like, lead most of the race. Actually, the one who led pretty much the entire race, in all honesty, was Matt Kenseth. I mean, he was really fast in that 20 car all day. Looked like he possibly would get the win if nobody else really was able to get a run on him. Um, but then a late caution came out, and that kind of just shuffled everything up. And when you've got, like, a few laps left to go at Talladega, it's just, it, it's just like an equation for disaster. And uh, there wasn't, there definitely wasn't no shortage of disasters. We had not one, but two big ones at this week's race. And what the big ones are are the big, big wrecks that involve, like, you know, tens of cars. I mean, they're huge wrecks, and when you're going that fast and you're and you're going three ride in these corners, you know, at 200 miles an hour, and you are just separated by inches, there's bound to be a wreck somewhere, especially when everybody is urgent. So I want to go over a few of those wrecks right now. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll get to the tempers, the emotions, and how the last lap happened. But uh, I first want to go over the Talladega big ones as they... Uh, so call it. So the first one I want to show you, or in this case, um, have you listen to the audio, is the wreck of uh, the the first big one that happened earlier in the race. So this one took out some of the big guys, like uh, uh, Greg Biffle was involved in this one, um, a few others. Jeff Gordon was uh, kind of involved. It kind of damaged him up, even though it didn't like really wreck him. Um, and I'll just let the rest of the commentation and the audio explain it to you. So uh, here you go, guys. Crash in turn one. Huge crash. Unbelievable crash. before it got to the start-finish line. They make a little light contact right here when Kyle looks like he's getting a push from Marcus Ambrose. He's 
starts to move to the outside and catches the back of the five car team and sends him, in, sends him around. Amy McMurray, and there goes the Hamlin. 29 of Harvey. Hamlin got hit by Ruben. Right, Nicholson and now, yeah. Hamlin's part of Vickers. Vickers. Rudeman. Mark Trex Jr. in 56 is basically all but stopped. Yeah, he just gets a little, he gets on that right rear corner, and then Casey comes off the corrects and comes right into the side of the 18 car, Kyle Bush, and then it's all from there. Here I come. Yeah, I'm all right, and I caused it. So that was video um, of the, or should I say audio, of the uh, wreck from the NASCAR booth during the uh, race yesterday. So uh, kind of kind of explain to you more. Um, actually, it was, uh, Case King was ahead of um, Kyle Busch. And Busch got a tiny bit of a run on him and just bumped him just the slightest bit, um, just, just at the wrong, you know, side, just at the wrong angle and, and time and, uh, that just that little 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 thing caused Casey to go around, hit the wall, and then come back out in front of everybody else. And of course, when you're going 200 miles an hour, there's no place to really stop, you know, and get around the guy. And then it was just all chaos from there. Like they said, there was Kevin Harvick involved, Tony Stewart was involved. Um, they didn't mention Greg Biffle, but he was involved. Um, Ambrose was involved. Just just a lot of different guys were involved, and it kind of wrecked a lot of the people's days. Um, Kyle Busch, of course, his day was was pretty dang, was pretty well ruined. A few other guys had a ruined day, but in all honesty, it didn't take out too much of the field, like really bad. But it did cause some damage on uh, probably at least half the cars. I mean, it was a pretty bad wreck. So uh, the other big one that I wanted to show you guys was the big one that uh, big one that happened later in the race. And this one, in my opinion, was just a little bit even was even bigger than the other one. Both both of them were pretty big. But this one was just a little bit bigger, and this one you can cl you can see a little bit better um, when you watch the video. But I'm gonna again play the guy play the audio from the NASCAR booth when this uh, wreck started. So uh, the second big one, Talladega. This one started by Ricky Stenhouse Jr. going to the side of JJ Yelly on the high side, coming down the back straightaway. Um, wrong move. Section closed up, and it was all chaos from there. So uh, here's the audio, guys. Okay, so that was the audio from the second big one at Talladega yesterday. Um, obviously, as you can probably tell, uh, Kurt Busch went for a wild ride. Man, his car flipped a few times and then landed right on uh, the hood and windshield of Ryan Newman. And it didn't sell well with Ryan Newman. I'll talk about that in a minute. But it all started when, uh, like I said, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. came uh, down the back straightaway. Went to the outside thinking he had a run, but the hole closed up with J.J. Yelly. He bumped into J.J. Yelly, and then Yelly come in, crossed over everybody, and then it was just chaos from there. Uh, like they said, both Labonte, both Labonte brothers involved. Jeff Gordon slid through the grass. He got some damage, so he was involved. Danica Patrick was involved. Um, uh, I believe Truex was also involved. There was just a lot of guys that just got their cars just totally destroyed in this one. Uh, in this wreck, and they also, and again, Clint Boyer also uh, was in this wreck pretty heavily. So it kind of ruined a lot of different guys' days, but yet there was still a m good majority of the field that was still out there when the finish came. So I can't wait to play this to you. This is the last two laps um, of audio from the race yesterday, and even just hearing it without even seeing it 
is just going to, you know, make your heart skip a beat. It This is why we love Talladega. So here's the auto of the last two laps on the green-white checkered, which, by the way, if there would have been a caution, the race would have ended because the track was get because the sky was getting too dark because they were racing, like, really, really late. And uh, Talladega, unfortunately, they don't have any lights for night racing yet. So uh, this would have been the only green flag uh, attempt to finish the race. If it had gone to yellow, the race would have ended uh, when the yellow flew, but it never did, and it caused for a great finish. So here it was, guys. All right, so that was the audio from the last two laps of the uh, Talladega race. As you can tell from all their excitement, a lot of last lap, a uh, lot of last uh, lap, just changing all around, just full excitement. And that's again why we love Talladega. Always great finishes and uh, brings out the best in some of the uh, lower, um, the lower underfunded teams. So it's great to see David Reagan win. Uh, David Gillen came in second, so it was a one-two punch win uh, for uh, uh, first row motorsports. I believe that's what the name is of them. Let me check it up here. Uh, uh, yeah, for, first row motorsports was is the uh, name of the uh, oh front row motorsports. Excuse me, front row motorsports is the name of the uh, motorsport company that supplies David Reagan and David Gillen with their cars. So huge uh, race weekend for them. I'm happy for them, and it's great to see uh, some, of, like I said, the lower underfunded teams be able to do so well and, and even win a big race like Talladega is. So, um, like I said earlier, um, there was some scrutiny about the wreck at the end of the race, especially from, uh, especially from Ryan Newman. And Newman, he didn't, he didn't have some very nice words to say uh, about NASCAR now. NASCAR, they have really, really safe cars, and um, and they have the safer barriers. They have all of that, but that still didn't sit well with Ryan Newman. In fact, here's what he said um, to Fox Sports after the race. He said, quote, they can build safer race cars, they can build safer walls, but they can't get their heads out of their, out of their explicative far enough to keep them on the racetrack, and that's pretty disappointing, Newman said. I wanted to make sure I get that point across. Y'all can figure out who they is, end quote. So it didn't sit too well with NASCAR. They haven't fined them yet, but um, they're not they're not saying whether they're going to fine them or anything. But 
you you can think that there probably will be at least some kind of penalty, you know, uh, against Ryan Newman for saying, you know, something to that extent to NASCAR, because NASCAR is a little safe, and for him to say that's a little bit out of the line. So, uh, with that win that David Reagan Gillen had, because they bunched up on the last lap and they were pushing each other, came down the middle, they, uh, they actually went below. Uh, Matt Kenseth and got past him doing it that way. They he they lost a draft in in Kenseth and they went on their own, got around uh, Carl Edwards. So if you can, I really suggest you take a look at the video of that win because it was really spectacular. But anyway, that's what Ryan Newman had to say about that uh, wreck, um, the the second big one that caused uh, Kurt Busch to land on his hood. So that is basically sums up the Talladega race now. Speaking of, you know, possible penalties, let's talk about uh, two penalties that I haven't talked about yet that actually did happen in the in the last few weeks. So uh, Matt Kenseth, of course, we all know he won at the Kansas uh, at the Kansas race uh, a few weeks back, but um, he failed a post race inspection um, when his when his car's engine was found to have a connecting rod lighter that was that lighter than the minimum weight specified in the rule book. So he had he so he had a connecting rod that was lighter than the minimum weight specified uh in his engine um by the rule book and uh that caused NASCAR to just give him a bunch of penalties. Um fifty points stocked from uh from the standings on Kansas part, a six week suspension uh for um the crew chief um, of Matt Kenseth, a two hundred thousand dollar fine to Matt Kenseth's crew chief, and even a and even uh, Richard Childress's uh, owner's license. All right, Richard Childress is the owner of Matt Kenseth's car. He lost his owner's license for six weeks, or at least it's frozen for six weeks. So definitely not the best thing. Or or I'm sorry about that. It was uh, Joe Gibbs Racing. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, Joe Gibbs Racing was the one that. Uh, supplies Matt Kenseth's uh, car, the owners of his car. Um, now, the other one went to Penske Racing a few weeks back. Um, they're still going through the appeals process, so that's why it's more current. But uh, what happened was it, it, it had to do with Brad Kozlowski and Joey Logano at the uh, April 13th Texas race. And what happened was is that both of them um, were, were issued penalties and suspensions for, quote, unapproved rear housing parts discovered during inspection of both cars, end quote. And that was, of course, during the April 13th Texas race. So uh, so NASCAR, the NASCAR panel, or the National Stock Car Racing panel, unanimously upheld the fines that were imposed on Brad Kozlowski and Joey Logano for having uh, that extra rear housing part parts. Um, Penske, uh, or... The team owner of Penske is going to try to appeal the process uh, or try to appeal the penalties once more. It'll now go to the chief appeal officer of John Middlebrook. And so he will hear from both sides um, next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Um, so we will see how that comes out. But right now it doesn't appear to be looking good for the Penske's. They're just hoping right now that the thing... Gets appeal that that the appeal works, but up to this point, you know, when the panel unanimously decides it, you know, and they and they and they upheld and the panel upheld the penalty, and and these fines, but it's not a surprise because they've upheld 103 of 150 appeals that have ever came through them. So that's just over 70 percent of the fines that go through the panel are going to get upheld. So we'll see where the penalties land them, but. As of right now, things not looking good for the Pensy crew, and unless they can win the final appeal, uh, it appears that they're going to be getting uh, some uh, the the fines, penalties, uh, suspensions, all of them together are going to uh, um, be put in place against the Penske team. Um, speaking of the penalties and fines, um, these are what specifically uh, those fines and penalties are. Um, Kozlowski and Logano were each stocked 25 points um, in the driver and the owner standings. $100,000 fines were placed against the crew chiefs of uh, uh, Brad Kozlowski and Logano, which are Paul, uh, which are Paul Wolf and Todd Gordon, respectively. Um, 
they also, or should I say, the panel also uh, uh, upheld, upheld, excuse me, a six-week suspension from point races as well as the May 18th All-Star race for uh, Paul Wolf, uh, Gordon, the two crew chiefs, um, the car chiefs of Jerry Kelly and Raymond Fox, engineers Brian Wilson and Samuel Stanley, and competition director Travis Geyser, or Geisler. All, t- uh, all worked with the teams in the past to race the Kansas and Richmond uh, pending the appeal. So uh, very, very strict fines coming against uh, the Penske's and, and uh, Logano and uh, Brad Kozlowski. So we'll see where it goes. But right now, things are really not looking good for the Penske crew. And it looks like those – and for at the moment, those uh, – the appeal has been denied and the penalties have been upheld. So uh, let's see where I'm at here. I'm at 20 minutes, so that actually works pretty good. Uh, it didn't take me as long as I thought I was going to take for the NASCAR thing, in all honesty. So let's head to the NBA, where we've got two big stories going on right now. Um, right now, one involves, uh, like I told you, there was one guy that wasn't really making an MVP with his parents, like I said. This guy is Kobe Bryant, all right? Kobe Bryant, Lakers already out of the NBA playoffs. Pretty disappointing season for them. Um, not Really not a good season. Got just doused in the first round of the playoffs where they got swept by uh, San Antonio Spurs four games to none. But uh, right now, Kobe Bryant, he's in a feud with his mother, all right? And he's in a feud with her about mementos that he's had um, during his early years, all right, with the Los Angeles Lakers and his high school years. So his mom is trying to sell these mementos of Kobe Bryant's. Now, of course, this comes back to the old question can your mom get rid of your stuff that a grown child or if you're grown and you've let stuff at the house can your mom sell it for you and make a profit off of it can they do that well uh kobe bryant obviously ain't too happy about it he's fighting it um and here's here's some of the stuff that uh his mom wanted to sell all right so he wanted to sell uh some of his jerseys practice gear and uh sweat suits from uh, his high school in uh, Lower Marion High School. He want, she wanted to sell some varsity letters, a trophy for being the most outstanding player in the 1995 Adidas ABCD basketball camp, and even a signed basketball from the 2000 NBA championship game. And then she also wanted to sell some rings for the 1996 uh, Pennsylvania High School championship, a pair of a pair that the Lakers made for Bryant parents for the 2002 or the 2000 NBA championship and one from the 1998 NBA All-Star game. So these are pretty valuable mementos. All right. These are, these are very, very valuable mementos. And so according to these court filings that I have here, uh, Kobe Bryant's mother, she struck a deal in January with golden auctions in Berlin, New Jersey, um, which earlier this year sold a rare, Honus Reidner baseball card for a record $2.1 million. So these guys really aren't messing. They're really not messing around. I mean, the, these guys really know how to sell, and they auction off big stuff. And so uh, she says that she got $450,000 up front, which she intended to use for a new home in Nevada. So, I mean, when you've got a son as rich as Kobe Bryant, as Kobe Bryant is, uh, I don't think he really would need it would be in need of a house, but apparently she is, and she needs four hundred fifty thousand dollars up front. And then, but Kobe Bryant claims that he offered to pay his mother up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars toward a new home that she wanted. So Kobe Bryant was trying to help his mother get a new home, but apparently it didn't work out that way, and uh, she didn't want the help. Apparently, yeah, she refused. And she said she wanted a four hundred fifty thousand dollars home. I mean, are you serious? It's hard enough for the average American to get four, to get a two hundred fifty thousand dollars home, let alone a four hundred fifty thousand dollars home. So, in my opinion, Kobe Bryant's number should have took should have took the money, especially if Bryant doesn't have you know good chemistry with his parents. I mean, obviously this deal would have worked out a lot better had had there been a better relationship between them. But she had to refuse a two hundred fifty thousand dollars home and go for the big four hundred fifty thousand dollars home. And uh, so. When, so when Kobe Bryant uh, turned her down to say, no, I'm not going to pay $450,000 for a stinking brand new home for you when you couldn't have taken $250,000 for a nice home, um, ESPN says it as, quote, that under, 
that unbeknownst to Kobe Bryant, she struck a deal to get the $450,000 in advance to the auction company. So that's where we're at now. She wanted to get four hundred. She she uh she got four hundred fifty thousand dollars advanced to the auction company through selling these uh, mementos. They haven't sold yet, but uh they they're they're trying to go. She's trying to get it through the process right now, and to to get these things sold. So uh so basically here's what uh, they said. Here's here's how the parents justified their decision. They said, "Quote: Brian's parents decided to sell his high school memorabilia without his consent." In order to purchase an additional home, Brian offered to pay to buy a house for his parents, but they wanted a larger one. Bang. Same thing I just said. They wanted a stinking bigger home, which I really don't get. I mean, $250,000 will really buy you a nice home these days. Um, uh, Let's see. I don't really want to do with the items uh, that the items belong to her. So basically what the auction house is saying, it's defending itself. It says that they say, quote, Kobe Bryant indicated to Pamela Bryant that the items belong to her. And he had no interest in them, so she put in. So she put them in a fifteen hundred dollar a month New Jersey storage unit, and this is all to prepare them to get auctioned off. And four hundred fifty thousand dollars—that's a lot of money. But we'll see. We'll see how it goes around. And Kobe Bryant's lawyer, lawyer heck, he's hired a, a lawyer to to do this on his mother for crying out loud. And the lawyer says, quote, Mr. Bryant's personal property has ended up in the possession of someone who does not lawfully own it. We look forward to resolving this legal matter through the legal system. So that uh, that that pretty much seals the deal right there, or I should say, end quote. But that pretty much seals the deal right there. And then ESPN also confirms here in the last sentence of the article that Brian has – that here's what they said, quote, Brian has had an, a sometimes icy relationship with his mother and father, Joe Jellybean Bryant former pro basketball player who is now coaching Tyler. So Kobe Bryant really doesn't like his parents, and he offered to help him turn them down, but I still don't think that gives them the right to take away his things if he said that, you know, he wants them or if he's going to this length to, to make sure his stuff is not sold. If it gets to that point, I say, you know, just give him the mementos. Some of those things, heck, I would not want to leave those things. I don't care if I've got NBA championships and stuff. Those things are still valuable. So I'd like to, ha- I'd like to keep those if I was Kobe Bryant, but... Kobe Bryant's choice, Pamela, Pamela uh, Bryant's choice, and we'll just see how it ends up. But I hope that, you know, even though I don't like Kobe Bryant, I hope he wins in this one, gets to keep those mementos if he really wants them because uh, those are pretty valuable. Um, the other big news involving another MVP, this time we're talking about LeBron James. Uh, LeBron James almost, almost historically unanimously got voted as the MVP, but he missed it by one vote. That other vote went to Carmelo Anthony. And don't get me wrong, Carmelo Anthony has been very, very good this year. But LeBron James, bar none, has been one of the best players on the court, including taking that heat on that 27 uh, straight games of, of wins. Um, he uh, he also he, – so LeBron James, with this uh, falling one vote shy of getting a unanimous MVP, he tied Shaquille O'Neal's thing which he also received 120 of 121 first place first place votes in ni- between 1999 and 2000 season um so he so he's tied with Shaquille O'Neal in, in that aspect but he's he still doesn't become the first player to unanimously get voted it so I I think he should have been unanimously voted I mean I think it was so clear that he should have been unanimously voted I can see Carmelo Anthony getting voted but just not by you know just one just one alone. That just doesn't make it just doesn't make sense to me. It it really doesn't. Um, so here's uh here's the numbers that LeBron James had this season that really set him apart from everybody else. Um so uh he so he had his bet one of his best seasons ever. He shot a career high fifty six and a half percent from the field, forty point six percent from three point range. He averaged twenty six point eight points, a career high eight rebounds, and even seven point three assists per game. So that's a very well all around basketball player so i'm pretty happy for james i i really think he deserves it um, based on those numbers and seeing him play he's a big leader and we'll see how far the heat can go however i don't think the Heat will win the championship this year even though they're pretty strong um I, i'm gonna i'm taking a few other teams but uh i don't i don't have the heat winning but i think the heat will still go pretty far this year um but i still don't have him winning it um as for uh what james wants to do next he wants to win uh, defensive player of the year is the next honor that he wants to get. Um, he finished second for the second time in his career for that award. He fell 
just behind Memphis Grizzlies center Marc Gasol. And, of course, Marc Gasol, uh, brother of Pau Gasol, um, very, very good defensive player on the Memphis Grizzlies. So uh, I don't think it'll be too long before LeBron James gets defensive player of the year. I think he will eventually get it. But uh, obviously this year wasn't the year, but he did get a nearly unanimous decision for uh, MVP. So that's the news there. And, uh, of course, LeBron is still trying to take his heat to an NBA title. Um, and lastly, let's uh, quickly go over uh, where the playoffs stand now. So we're down to the second round. Um, tonight, Chicago beat Miami 93-86. to 86. So LeBron James and the Heat are already down one game to none to Chicago in the second round of these playoffs or the semifinals. Um, currently, we've not, right now, we've got the game between Golden State and San Antonio. The updated score on that, uh, Golden State currently leads 46-41 to 41 over San Antonio. And, of course, Golden State did very well uh, last round as they beat the uh, Denver Nuggets. Um, OKC, Memphis, they're going to square off tomorrow. Uh, same thing with Indiana and New York. Indiana uh, got the, uh, beat the beat the Hawks to move into the next round. New York beat the Celtics. Um, let's see who else. Um, Chicago beat uh, the New York Nets in, or not New York Nets, sorry, uh, Brooklyn Nets, I should say, in uh, seven games to get to where they are now. So now it's Chicago, Miami, uh, Indiana, New York, Golden State, San Antonio, and Memphis, and uh, Oklahoma City Thunder is the next round. So we'll see how everything uh, comes out. And uh, we will we'll just see how everything plays out pretty much. Um, right now, Chicago obviously kind of made an upset over Miami. Miami, that's their first loss of this NBA playoffs. And right now we've got a close game between Golden State and San Antonio. Personally, here's my picks for the for this uh, next round of the playoffs. I still I, I have actually Miami over Chicago at this point. I have Indiana over New York. I'm going to say Golden State nearly wipes out San Antonio. I think they're going to win pretty much every game in the series. Maybe it might, it might take them five or six games, but I think they're really going to be dominant in the series. And then uh, finally, I got uh, Oklahoma, or no, actually I have Memphis over Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, of course, doesn't have Russell, Russell Westbrook. Um, so I don't think they'll go that far until I think Memphis is a very good team, but uh, Russell Westbrook, I don't think uh, OKC could probably make it to the next round, but I don't think they'll win the championship without Westbrook. And then finally, Chicago tonight on another end. Derrick Rose did not play uh, in the uh, in this fir- in the first game of the series between Chicago and Miami. So that pretty much sums up the uh, this edition of the NBA and NASCAR Power Half Hour. I'll see you next week with more NBA news. NASCAR news. Uh, we're coming up on some. We're coming up on the ending of the playoffs. We got the All Star race coming up. Dover. Lots of different uh, NASCAR racetracks coming up. And of course, any other weird sports news, I will get to you um, next week. I'll try to go briefly over um, some of the other sports. Uh, briefly over baseball. Briefly over the NHL playoffs because they're also happening right now. So, just give you a full scoop on everything next week. So uh, until next week, um, until my next show, I should say, uh, next week, I hope you guys have a good one, and I will see you all next week. Goodbye, everybody.